today let's talk a little bit about collective authorities and why transparency and decentralized trust at scale are actually important. So uh, there is internet authorities. We all use them on a very, very regular basis, right? So every, every day or in, uh, yeah, every day we are, we are using these internet authorities. We, uh, our devices, they are synchronizing uh, the time. Uh, they are resolving uh, domain names. Like for example, when you uh, browse to the .security IO webpage, then you're asking for the IP address or you're asking your certificate provider to get a TLS certificate to establish an HTTPS connection, or in the background, your, your laptop would, uh, for example, ask your software update center if there are new, new updates available. The authorities then uh, create the messages uh, that contain the requested information and send them back to us, right? So they would, uh, for example, send us the correct time, the IP address, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, we all trust in the authorities that the information that they provide is actually valid and legit. And um, because the information and the details that we get, uh, they are often highly sensible and they are also required for, to maintain our own security online. Put differently, th our own security depends crucially on the secure operation of these internet authorities. However, as we all know, things can go wrong, right? So an attacker can break into your time service and he can provide you with a, with a wrong time, uh, which then might lead to freeze attacks. Uh, an attacker can hijack your naming authority and uh, send you a wrong IP address and then basically man in the middle you. If an attacker manages to to break into your certificate authority, then he can issue certificates for arbitrary domains and basically mount impersonation attacks. And finally, if he is able to break into your software update center, then he can uh, send you no updates at all when you uh, request or ask for them. He can uh, send you old updates, selling them as new, or he can even send you maliciously backdoored updates, right? So, um, every one of us who is following the news knows that basically there is every week there is some kind of incident where one of where we hear of uh, an, a compromised authority, and uh, in the in the internet security model these authorities are often uh, the the weakest link. However, uh, the authorities do not only face technical threats; they also face a lot of legal threats. So, for example, remember the, F, uh, the FBI versus Lavabit incident. So, Lavabit was a, a secure email provider that was used by Edward Snowden back in uh, 2013 when he was preparing his leaks and when, when he was in contact with uh, certain journalists. And after uh, the FBI found out about that, they said, hey, Lavabit, give us your crypto keys. And by the way, this is a subpoena, so you can't tell anybody about that. And uh, all that Lavabit could do was basically comply with this request. However, the one thing that they, they actually uh, yeah, sold it back to the FBI was that the FBI did not specify how they wanted to get the crypto keys delivered. So what the Lavabit owner basically did is he printed the crypto keys, uh, keys in four-point teeny tiny font and sent them to the FBI, much to the delight of the FBI, as you can imagine. And anyhow, so after, after that, Lavabit shut down uh, to avoid being complicit in crimes against his customers. Another such case was just from last year when uh, the, Apple, the Apple versus FBI incident, where um, the FBI did not send a secret subpoena, but instead uh, tried in a public showdown to force Apple uh, to create and sign a backdoor iOS version in order so that they can access the data on the San Bernardino shooter. Um, Apple, of course, fought this request by all means possible, and a lot of tech companies and digital rights groups rallied to the, the side of Apple to help them. In the end, the FBI had no other chance as to back off because of this huge public, uh, public uh, uh, pressure that they were facing. So in this case, uh, the, the debate was public, uh, and the question becomes, how do we actually ensure that, this, uh, that such important debates 
remain public and are not getting dragged back into the darkness as in the Loverbit case. Um, so as a matter of fact, what we also have to realize is that no individual uh, entity, be it a hardware platform, a software, a person, or an authoritative organization, is actually immune to compromise or coercion. So the next question becomes, how do we defend ourselves against that? From a legal perspective, there is a very nice uh, mechanism called warrant canaries. So companies tend to, uh, tend to publish these transparency reports, where in the beginning they have a, a statement saying, okay, in the last X month, we have not been served with a, with a secret subpoena and a gag order. So, and once this statement is missing, their customers basically know that within the last X months, they have been served with actually such a subpoena. Um, so this is a very nice legal self-defense mechanism, but wouldn't it be even nicer to have also from a technical perspective, a complementary uh, solution? So at this point, let me tell you a story. So this picture shows Ulysses um, and his crew on one of his adventures. And in particular, it shows when they are facing the sirens. So Ulysses knew when he would listen, he and his crew would listen to the song of the sirens, that they get, would get seduced by, by this song and had no other chance than jump uh, off board and drown basically in the sea. So, but Ulysses wanted to listen act to, to the song of the siren. So this is kind of a dilemma. So what, what do, did he do? And he came up with something which is known as the Ulysses pack, where he said to his crew, okay, you all put wax into your ears and you tie me up to this mast. And no matter what I do or what I say, you do not unbind me from this mast and you do not listen to me. Um, so in that sense, wouldn't it be also nice to have something similar for our internet authorities, where basically the internet authorities represents Ulysses, and then we have some kind of crew that double checks the actions of Ulysses. So how can we achieve that? Let's go back to our example of uh, Apple versus IFI. So imagine Apple would issue a new software, up, a new iOS update, and it signs it with its signing keys. Um, but now, in addition to that, we have a bunch of public witnesses which represent Ulysses' crew who would also sign off on this, uh, on this uh, software update. Um, and even if the, the witnesses cannot inspect what they signed off, because it's, for example, in binary format, already the process of signing off on this software update increases the transparency because it attests that a certain amount of external third parties actually have seen this software update, which kind of uh, disincentivizes the secret backdooring approach that the FBI, for example, attempt is attempting to do once in a while. So an Apple would then um, configure its devices to accept a new update only if it was signed by Apple and a threshold of these external uh, parties. Um, so what we achieved now is we went from this weakest link security to a stronger model, where uh, in order to subvert the security of the whole system, actually multiple of these chain elements have to break before the whole uh, security falls apart. But the, the problem, the question becomes now, uh, is this actually enough? Because when we are facing nationwide adversaries, then who guarantees us that a resourceful adversary, if he can break into one server, he cannot also break into 10 servers, right? So what we actually want is a lot of these public witnesses making it very, very hard uh, for even resourceful adversaries to break into all of them to subvert the security of the system, which leads me to this notion of collective authorities. But uh, in this process uh, of trust splitting, we have to make sure that it scales, but not only that, it also has to increase the security, the diversity, and also the independence of, the, of all the parties and of the whole system involved. So, and this brings me to this concept that we call decentralized witness co-signing, where the authority uh, would join up with a bunch of witnesses in this, into this collective authority, and then together they would issue these very compact collective signatures on the statement as before. 
and clients could download these statements and very efficiently very, uh, check that the statement was signed by this authority and uh, a threshold of uh, these witnesses. In addition to that, every of the witnesses would, of course, have a public log where they uh, actually log in which signing rounds they were involved. So to give you uh, an intuition on, on what we imagine here is that, so on the left-hand side, you see this excerpt from a public petition where people si would sign off on this petition, and then you go manually to, through all the signatures to check, okay, is this, uh, is, are these enough and is this good? But from a technical perspective, this is kind of annoying, right? That you have to go through all these uh, signatures individually to verify that this is good. So what collective signatures give you is this superposition of signatures where you have this very condensed representation that you can verify very efficiently. So in the, the method that allows us to do this is a protocol called collective signing, which basically uh, allows you to create a Schnorr signature in a distributed way. And this COSI protocol has four steps. The first one is an announcement phase where the uh, authority announces to its witnesses which statement it wants to sign. Then the witnesses reply with, a, a commit, with commits values that they generated randomly, and the authority would aggregate all these commit values into this by summing them basically up into this V value. Um, and from this S statement and the V value, the authority would generate a challenge and rebroadcast that down to, the, to its witnesses. And finally, in a final bottom-up mechanism, the witnesses use the, the secret commit that was uh, generated in step two, together with the challenge and their secret key to to compute a response and send it back up. And again, the, the authority uh, collects all these responses into one very compact value uh, and publishes this tuple CR as the collective signatures, which can then very efficiently verify it against the aggregate public key. So COSI gives you some very nice features. It gives you the strongest link robustness where actually multiple entities of your system have to be, provide, uh, have to be compromised before the security falls apart. It also gives you proactive uh, security guarantees where uh, the witnesses can check the statements that they are signing off, and if, they are, if the checks fail, then they just refuse to sign, uh, which then might lead to the scenario where the authority cannot gather enough signatures to get a, a valid collective uh, signature. And this also increases transparency because all the witnesses uh, do these sanity checks and additionally log this publicly, what, what they were seeing and what they were signing. And COSI is also highly scalable thanks to these aggregation techniques that I mentioned on the last slide and also the communication trees that we are using here. So to give you an intuition, um, if you uh, do the signing step, then it's basically logarithmic in the number of nodes that you have. So, and for example, f we did some experiments and with 8,000 nodes, you can create such a collective signature in about two seconds. Whereas the result of that, since it's basically a normal signature, you can verify this in constant time. Um, so also to show you, uh, to give you an intuition on what you can achieve with this collective signing, um, let's have a look at, uh, at the, the, the various security and transpa transparency levels. So on the, on the lowest end, you have like the traditional authorities that would not use witness co-signing and uh, have no public logs. Then on the first level, you have these, author these collective authorities that use the witness co-signing and are logging their, their steps. And even if they are checking nothing, this already increases the security and transparency of the whole system dramatically because you have these public attestations that enough of these witnesses actually saw the statement that they signed. So this is a very generic approach and uh, existing uh, authorities could be very easily upgraded to, to use this kind of mechanism. The next one is 
um, that the witnesses actually check on what they are signing. For example, in the case of software updates, they could run a reproducible build and verify the binary that they, that they should sign. And only if the repro reproducible build succeeds, they sign off on the, on the, uh, or participate in this COSI round. And the, the, the strongest level is when the, uh, the authority, together with all the witnesses, are joined up in a, in a BFT consensus group and uh, run a consensus mechanism to check the consistency of tri distributed processes, which is very, very helpful in blockchain-based applications uh, and cryptocurrencies. So in the final moments of this talk, let me show you some applications where you can actually use these kind of technology. So the one, as I already mentioned, is you can build a very scalable, strongly consistent blockchain technology from that. So by moving the miners into a consensus, all the miners that are, for example, in Bitcoin into a consensus group, um, and which are running this COSI-based consensus mechanism, you get a very, very uh, strong uh, guarantees from that. So you get a non-probabilistic Byzantine fault-tolerant consensus. Uh, which gives you a very low latency with respect to transaction commitment. So it's not like minutes or hours as in Bitcoin, but it's like below half a minute. Uh, it also increases the throughput in comparison to Bitcoin by two orders of magnitude. So Bitcoin currently can do roughly seven transactions per second, whereas this system can achieve up to 700 transactions per second. And this is basically the same level that PayPal is currently operating, for example. And it can also be used in a permissioned and a permissionless uh, setting. Um, the next application that you can use this kind of technology for is when you combine COSI with a uh, cryptographic technique which is called secret sharing, then you can build a very, very efficient uh, public ra distributed randomness beacon from it, So, which also gives you bias resistance and uh, third-party verifiability. So basically the same thing that we saw in Joseph Bonneau's talk where they were pulling the randomness from the from the blockchain, you can build a similar kind of system, but without relying on a blockchain. And the final example is the one that I've already mentioned quite a, quite a bit, is you can build a very, a very nice uh, decentralized software update system from that, that increases the transparency of the whole uh, software update process a lot. So what you basically do is the, the developers would uh, send a pre-release of the software package to uh, what we call a, uh, update authority, and they would run reproducible builds on this software package and check if they actually can regenerate the binaries. And only if that is uh, true, they would participate in this uh, witness co-signing round. Uh, and when it's successful, your software release has a collective signature on it, and clients can go and download these uh, collectively signed software packages and very efficiently verify the source to binary uh, correspondence of this whole process. So to get further details, uh, you can check out our uh, GitHub page. On uh, the, the whole project is under dedis slash authority, where you find the code, but you also find further links to like the research papers and, and a bunch of blog posts that we've written. So that's it from my side. Thanks for your attention.